The whole project is a thing of the heart uh, by a lot of people, not just me. This program is about the perspectives and work of artist and culture critic Larry Kirkwood. It has been compiled from an interview with Larry and from his public lecture and exhibit at the University of Wyoming in February 2002. Larry makes body casts of men and women. In working with these individuals, in exhibiting their casts, and in making public appearances, he is trying to break down barriers. These are barriers that we put up against ourselves and each other, and barriers that we allow society to perpetuate. Larry's Body Image Project works on two different levels. At the individual level, the people who have body casts made experience something remarkable. Larry talks about the experience as being a stop on the journey to self-discovery. In the process of casting their bodies, Larry tries to help them look at themselves differently see themselves aesthetically, and understand themselves better. In terms of the second level, the group level, he tries to reach all of us. He wants us to see every human body as beautiful, instead of judging it by a pencil-thin standard set by a beauty industry that seeks to make money without regard to people's health or well-being. Larry is a sincere and ardent crusader against sexism, weightism, ageism, racism, virtually any prejudice based on a person's appearance. Instead, he urges us to judge people, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., on the content of their character. Larry calls upon us, individually and collectively, to speak out against all forms of prejudice and to act in ways to promote acceptance of ourselves and others. Through his Body Image Project, Larry has devoted his life to what he calls the search for the real. We open with Larry describing his background, his philosophy, and how the project got started. I was brought up in a small Iowa town, and um, at the times everything was very racist, very sexist, and of course I was like everybody else. And when the 60s came along, um, I was majoring in philosophy. Um, I believe this could be a better world, and since that time I've worked to make it that way. I've tried to use my artwork that way. This isn't about me, it's about you, it's about the people that are in this show, and it's about humankind. I, I was very close to my maternal grandmother. Uh, she was a Quaker, and she really instilled a lot of the tenets in me that comes out in this project. Um, you know, this project has just taken on a life of its own. I. Uh, was getting ready to do a series of paintings. I'd had my studio in South Florida for 18 and a half years. I moved back to the Midwest, and a friend of mine was going to the Art Institute and was just kind of doing body parts. And I thought, what would it look like just to do a cast? And almost immediately upon doing a full cast, um, a form of this came up, and I decided I would do 60 people to show what we do look like. And through working with the people and the feedback that I got, um, I realized that what I had a hold of was extremely important. And what this project is today um, is not how it started out. It's just it's kind of unfolded itself. And um, I've learned a tremendous amount. The point is that this isn't my project. It's an our project. And it takes a tremendous amount of people to pull it off. And I'm ever so grateful of all the people that have spent their time and their effort to do this because I do a certain part of it, but without these other people, I wouldn't be here. Now, as far as the art with this, it functions on two different levels. It's the viewing of it and the participation. As far as viewing it, it allows us to look and see what people really look like in a neutral, non-pornographic setting. And I'm really excited to see some younger people here tonight because I think we do have a natural curiosity as to what people look like. And, you know, it's okay to see. It's just that when it's stretched out, airbrushed, and, and uh, in a pornographic setting, that is very harmful. But when you can be in an educational setting like this and to be able to see this, I think that's wonderful.
I realize that we all have views and there may be some of these things that I say that you may not agree with or whatever. It's just um, these are things that um, I've gleaned from this project. I've grown tremendously. I've learned a tremendous amount from it. And, uh, you know, you may not ag agree with what I say, but I would appreciate if you just listen to it, maybe think about it a little bit. You know, our culture is obsessed with keeping up appearances. Since for many of us, our skin has become the wrapping for our self-esteem, this is really having some serious detrimental effects. We're not much good to ourselves nor to society if we don't have any self-confidence. And unfortunately, a lot of these advertisements uh, are aimed right at taking your self-confidence away from you so that you'll buy their products to try and feel better again. What I like to look at this project as is the search for the real. Now, as far as the cast making, I've worked with um, 423 people so far, uh, ages 15 to 77. And it takes two hours to do, um, or I ask people to set two hours aside. It really only takes about 20 minutes to take the cast. But in that hour and a half, I, I really have to do a lot of tap dancing because a lot of people are extremely nervous. But it's my responsibility to make people feel comfortable. Um, I have to kind of let them get to know me. I need to know who they are because I use a lot of the stories that they tell me. And I think people are really pretty open as far as what they say to me. I also have a responsibility to get them to be able to look at themselves in a different manner after we're done with this cast so that they can understand themselves a little bit. I, I kind of look at this as just uh, kind of a little stop on the way to self-discovery. Now I work with both genders. Um, Absolutely no body, bodily mutilation is intended by the way that I finish these. I want them to look like that they were in a bas relief or a frieze over in Greece and Rome and somebody just kind of ripped them out of the wall. I want to be able to give the people who participate uh, anonymity. Um, and it's for them and it's for me. If people know who they are, then they see that person. They don't, I no longer can teach the lessons that I need to teach about shape and form. The interesting thing about this show is, yes, it's a visual art show, but the reality is it has very little to do with the outside. It has everything to do with the inside. We're just using the outside to get there. As far as the surfaces on it, there's two purposes for it. One is I want to get them as far away from naked as I can, and so it kind of gives a distance when it has these surfaces. Also, it gives us an opportunity to see, gee, we come in a variety of colors. It may not be purple and the reds that are out there, but humanity does come in a variety of colors. For Larry, a big part of what he terms the truth and the real is the beauty of all human bodies. He talks about seeing that beauty in shapes and forms. When I work with a shape like this, uh, and I guess probably I've really delved into art history a lot, and. I usually use a short arm, and one of the reasons I do is because it's just, it really has this wonderful feeling of like the Venus of Willendorf or a fertility goddess, and I think it's very, very earthy and very empowering, and, and I just, I really like them, and, and I think that it's just, it has all these wonderful things, and that we can really see the beauty in this piece, and one of the things that I tell people, uh, the mistake that we make is when we look at ourselves, we don't look at ourselves throughout, we look at a certain part of our body and then we compare it to somebody else's body. What your genes are and somebody else's are absolutely has nothing to do with each other. The way that we can see beauty is to not identify but to see shape and form pitted against other shapes and forms and this just shows you that it's just an absolutely wonderfully uh, beautiful piece and we need to be able to see roundness versus roundness and roundness and the different shapes that are within our own body, not as compared to somebody else's body. Valuing their own body is an important part of what Larry hopes people experience when they participate in having their body cast done. It's kind of neat. The minute you take that cast off, you're older than that cast is. And, and, it's, and a lot of people liking it to giving birth to themselves. I mean, it's just, it's really interesting to see the people's reactions when they take this thing off. And, you know, the difference between somebody sketching or painting or, or sculpting somebody is that it depends on their talent level and their, and their view, whereas this is that person. You know, I, I really enjoy working with people that it's just they're so nervous they can hardly stand still because that means that 
they're stretching themselves out for a new experience and I think that's really important. I also think that there's a time to do this and, and I never really push anybody to do it because uh, there are a lot of people who have told me, gee, last year I could have never done this. So it's something that you've got to kind of be ready to do and I don't know if you really know that you're ready, but if you're going to do it, you are ready to do it. When I did this show at this university and I threw it open to people there, a, a woman, she was 57 and uh, she and her husband just became empty nesters. Their kids were off to college and so they would kind of decided, well, we're going to do some kind of new and exciting things. So she decided she wanted to do that. I mean, she was absolutely nervous and I can remember and this, my studio is in my home and she was taking a shower after it was over and I'm in the other room and she hollered out, she said, do you know that you're the first man's house I've ever taken a shower at other than my husband? So, <laughs> you know, she really, and the night of the show, I saw she and her husband and her children looking at her piece. And <laughs> so when she came over and talked to me and I said, well, you know, what, what did your family think about it? And she got this kind of sly grin on her face. She said, you know, I just decided this was something for me. I didn't think they needed to know about it. And I thought, wow, here's Pop and the kids standing there staring at Mom in the art show and they didn't even know it. So uh, that was pretty interesting. But a thing that I find interesting is about 80% of the people that I worked with didn't really know what they looked like. A lot of things that people do to each other just blabbergast me. Um, I had one male that I worked with and he kept referring to himself as skinny and he wasn't at all. He'd been sexually molested when he was 15 and I think that due to that trauma he just shut the view of his body off and he had absolutely no idea what he looked like. And this was really at the age of 30, the first time that he really saw himself. Um, I worked with two contemporary dance troupes where I did their cast and then they were used in concert. To the one, all the women that I took the cast of looked at their cast and they said, gee, am I that small? Um, when we look in a mirror, it's anything but objective. I mean, the reflection you see is not substance and all of a sudden these tapes start working in your head. Uh, we have a tendency to look at different parts and we, we fail to notice the subtle aspects and, and women's magazines are absolutely famous for this. It's like work on your chest, but after you work on your chest, don't compare it to the rest of your body, compare it to this picture over here. Well, that picture has absolutely nothing to do with you and it never will. Now the concept of beauty is a value term and for many people it's tied into self-worth. And In our culture, beauty is being defined and serviced by the beauty industry. In a society that buys into appearance as reality, the resulting anxiety is the very basis for the beauty industry. Normal body change is labeled losing our looks. Plastic surgeons refer to everything they don't like as a deformity. Aging is called a tropic deformity. Women in particular are targeted with message that they are not real women unless they are thin or they can't both look their age and look good. The worn out idea of woman as object or possession is utilized to the max in the beauty game. Now women as opposed to men are not popularly admired for their physical appetites but only their denial of them. The beauty industry seems to go to great lengths to intimidate women into making themselves as small as possible. This is about power and it's about control. In terms of how we might help ensure equal opportunity for all, a first step may be to understand each other better and to realize that even though people can look and seem like us, they can be facing very different challenges. And you know, we have a very narrow vision as to we live our life and, and we think that everybody else has the same life. When I was in Manhattan, Kansas, a woman came up to me and she said, I really need to be on your show. She said, everybody keeps telling me what a good body I have and how lucky I am. She says, I have cancer, brain cancer. And the week that we did her cast, the cancer had spread down her spine and she could barely stand there to do the cast. Um, I had heard the next week that it spread to her lungs and to her ribs and I don't know um, if she's still alive or not. The piece that's in here, the mastectomy, is a 69 year old woman. Um, I wanted the mastectomy piece in here. I guess my, my thought was maybe not so much of the person going through it, but the caregiver. Um, you know, sometimes we kind of get wrapped up and we look at we're losing things and I thought, you know, if the caregiver could see this and see that it's no big deal, you're not losing anything, it's just another shape and that the body takes. She wanted to do it because, and I don't know how long ago she'd had the mastectomy, but she said when she went in to do it, the only thing available to her were line drawings. And she says, I, I had the fear that I was going to have this tremendous crater in my chest. And she said because of society's 
fixation on breasts. She said, I wouldn't go out of the house for a month after, after it was taken off. So she wanted to participate so that she could help other people that have to go through this. And one of the letters I got from, I think it was in, uh, at Kansas State, um, was a woman who uh, said that the week that the exhibit went up, she said, my mother had a mastectomy, and she said, I was just so distraught. She said, I came to the show, and I saw this piece, and she said, it was okay. She said, it showed me that, yes, my mom's all right. So, actually, I think that, that um, ma the mastectomy pieces are probably the most important and powerful pieces that I do have in this exhibit. Larry now shares a story about two students who projected very different meanings on the same body cast, the woman who had a mastectomy. Now, I don't know, it's on the poster and, and the piece that's out there with the mastectomy. I mean, sometimes you miss it because it has this absolutely gorgeous shape, um, but one of the breasts are gone. At one of the schools, they had the kids write a review, so I'm going to read you two different people's uh, review. Person A, I predict that the life she has led has been one of full of overeating and rejection. Person B, same thing, same thing that they're looking at. I feel this woman is so courageous. As I was driving home, I was thinking about what I was going to write, and I started crying. This woman was so brave and so secure in herself that she has my utmost respect because she, in no uncertain terms, is telling the world, here I am, so what if I'm not perfect? So what if my body doesn't fit into a size eight? I'm somebody, I count, I'm here, I've beaten cancer, I'm alive. So it's the same thing, it's just the way you choose to look at it. Uh, I've worked with two women, and one of the pieces are out here who are six foot five and centers for major basketball teams. Uh, also worked with a woman that was six foot two who absolutely hated sports. Um, worked with a woman who was four foot one. When I spoke of uh, discrimination and size, I usually thought about it in a horizontal mode. I really hadn't thought about it in a vertical mode until I talked with a woman who was six foot two. We took her cast about two in the afternoon, and I said, well, how many times have people said things to you about your height? And she thought for a minute, and she said, well, five. And I said, over what period of time? She said, since this morning. And she says, you know, people that look at you and, and get upset because you're tall and you're not a basketball player or a model, she says, I'm not supposed to fit what your notion is. I had the opposite experience of working with a woman that was four foot one. Now, I have to admit, I was really ashamed because when she walked in that door, I saw a short person. Once I took that cast off of that person, all of a sudden I saw a human being. But discrimination is not limited to body size and shape. Now we classify people at arbitrary ages into categories such as senior citizens or middle-aged. Here again, it keeps us from recognizing the most important identity, that is a unique and valuable human being. And I tell people, I said, look, you know, 20 years and 20 pounds ago, I was not a better person than I am now. Now Larry further explores the emptiness of the so-called ideal image and the need for us to value people of all ages. I think that it's these changes that make us interesting. I don't want to look out here and see everybody looking like the, the same thing. I mean, it's just that wouldn't be interesting at all. Now our society seems to value everything else for age except human beings. Antiques, vintage automobiles, how old liquor is, the length of one's company. I mean, everybody breaks founded in 1973, but when it comes to human beings, it's a different thing. Now, here's a real good indicator. I have a little test for you, and I've flunked this sucker about every time I've taken it. All right, how do you feel when somebody says, uh, well, you don't look or act your age? Do you feel complimented? If you feel complimented, then you're age prejudice. But it's just, it's something that I've gone through, and it's like, oh, tee hee, gee, I must look so good. Larry has looked into health-related research that documents the importance of fitness over fatness. And then he goes on to talk about his perspectives on women, clothing sizes, and identity. Um, as far as size, I mean, for some odd reason, people don't accept the fact that we come in a variety of sizes. And a commonly used reason for weight prejudice is that larger people are unhealthy. And it is true, there are health problems um, that are associated with extreme weight. But on the other hand, it's true that many larger people are, are much healthier than untold numbers of uh, very thin people who practice a wide variety of unhealthy practices. Now, I happen to be a child of the 60s or a flower child or hippie or whatever you want to call it, and I will guarantee you that all the people I knew were thin did not get that way to trips to the gymnasium. 
Now there's a research work done by the Cooper Institute in Dallas claims that obese people who exercise have half the premature death rate that those who are thin but do not exercise. So it's a myth to judge somebody by that size. And our notion of society that body size alone is a reliable measure of physical, emotional, and moral well-being, it just doesn't work. And another interesting thing I found out. In our society, men wear a size of clothing, women are a size of clothing. Almost every female I've talked to, it's not, I wear a size such and such, it is, I am a size such and such. It's my contention that our society tries to make women as small as possible, and it's, it's not only a social thing, it's a political thing. Now what we don't have, the cosmetic surgery will be happy to give us. Now we have to remember there's some absolutely wonderful things that plastic surgery can do, dealing with burn victims and, and different deformities, so, um, you know, I'm not dissing the whole thing, but there are really a lot of scum out there associated with the stories I've read just uh, curled my toes. Turning now to beauty pageants, Larry notes that in 1998, 40 of the 51 contestants in the Miss USA pageant had breast implants. In the 2001 Miss Universe pageant, Miss Brazil had undergone four plastic surgeries and 19 cosmetic procedures. So much for natural beauty. If little Susie Brown looks at Miss Brazil and says, gee, I'm going to look like her, it ain't going to be by going to the gym. So how does Larry view marketing? And what does he think we can do about it? Encouraging body hatred is an extremely lucrative uh, business. The mass media disseminates these images and messages, and they are subtle, and they are constant. Now, I worked in advertising for a while. The credo in advertising is, you sell the sizzle, not the steak. You know, when those, I lost 800 pounds in three days advertisements come on, shut them off. <laughs> It's not just TV ads that are destructive. Larry maintains that TV shows also contribute to many body image problems. He mentions Oprah Winfrey specifically. I mean, she's done a tremendous amount for women and minorities. However, she's supported by the beauty industry. Sends messages uh, from her constant dieting. Um, a makeover is nothing more than saying, you're not good enough the way you are, but if you buy these products, then you will be. According to Larry, Real beauty is not measurable and is unrelated to standards set by the beauty industry. Now as far as formal goes, that has to do with juxtaposition of shape, form, balance, and harmony. Now the, the beauty industry model is that beauty is an inherent quality of the image. They stick this picture up of a skinny, young, white female and they say this is beauty and this is what you need to look like. Um, both Plato and Socrates pushed the idea that beauty was an uh, inherent quality, but it was then uh, dropped in the 18th century. And I'll use this as an example to show. All right, what can you say about this? You can say it's square, you can say it's red, and you can say it's beautiful. Now, if you take scientific measurement, you can measure the squareness and you can measure the redness. But how do you measure the beauty? It's not in here, it comes from in there and in there. Larry quotes Harriet Lerner author of The Dance of Anger and The Dance of Intimacy. And this quote is from her book, and it really applied to romantic relationships, but it fits this perfectly. We cannot make another person change their steps to an old dance, but if we change our own steps, the dance no longer can continue in the same predictable pattern. It's our responsibility, if we want to make change, we have to be the ones to change. This can be a better world, and, and it needs to be a better world. And particularly after 9-11, you know, it's like our whole country's values have been challenged. All right, well, maybe it's time to examine what those values are. And, you know, we claim this is freedom and equal opportunity for all. Well, is it? Or is it freedom and equal opportunity for some and not for others? We need to know what we stand for. If it's going to be challenged, then let's find out. And let's not just talk about it. Let's do it.